I saw where Phil Hawkins had been influenced by De Palma and even and was working like low budget De Palma. Color field, I could tell by his frame sometimes and, and his use of suspense and just how smart the film was. I never set out to become a horror icon. Something I wasn't planning, it's just something that happened. So I watched the documentary, absolutely loved it. I've actually been looking forward to it for a while because I read your book when I was back ah. in college. So big, big fan. And so the documentary mentions a film called The Last Showing, which you you said you were quite proud of and want more people to see. And so I took your advice and I watched the film and it's wonderful. And so I'm curious as to what it is about that film in particular that stands out to you personally. I'm a big fan of Brian De Palma. For me, he's, uh, he's very hypnotic. I think the first 30 minutes of Blowout with John Travolta is just absolutely hypnotic. There's sequences of Dress to Kill that are hypnotic. But an early, early De Palma film uh, called Sisters really struck a chord with me. And William Finley's performance in that is probably the best mad doctor except for Bride of Frankenstein I've ever seen. And uh, Margot Kidder is just bizarre and luscious and brilliant in that film. And so I, I saw when I was doing Last Showing, I saw where Phil Hawkins had been influenced by De Palma and, even, and was working like low budget De Palma. Uh, color field, I could tell by his frame sometimes and his use of suspense and just how smart the film was uh, and his sense of humor. And, and, and Phil's just this amazing filmmaker. So I knew I was in good hands. But the real secret of that film is the performance by Finn Jones, who I discovered, you know, in, Th in, in Game of Thrones. But Finn is so raw in that film. And he's he he does that trick where he realizes everything that's happened to him is the audience knows about the audience knows every. So when you watch Finn, you get you, you get this 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 tightening in your stomach. I'm there and I'm good in the film and I'm your I, I'm, I'm your antagonist. But without Finn's, you know, Finn is the sacrificial lamb. And the audience knows that and they get more and more frustrated at, at poor Finn goes down the rabbit hole with all of my traps, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and his performance, he's, he gauged it, you know, so wonderfully. I remember I used to see him, he was doing, he might've been doing Game of Thrones at the same time. <laughs> he had to keep going up north and I'm presuming Belfast, but mm -hmm. I would see him, you know, he, he has that trick where he could just fall asleep anywhere. <laughs> and I couldn't tell I, for a while. I thought, well, my God, we're beating him up here. You know, he's so in character. It's just exhausting. him. But I think he was also rushing up to do some stuff on Game of Thrones at the same time. But his performance is just amazing. I mean, Emily Barrington's wonderful, too. Everybody's good in that movie. But but Finn, it's just a really, really raw nerve. And he's realized that he can tap into the viewer at home or in the movie theater. Uh, because he knows they they know everything he knows. And that's happened to me a couple of times in plays. And you just, you know, there's a moment where you just feel the audience, you've got them in the palm of your hand. Mm -hmm. And then so, you know, Finn sort of drags them through the hell that is his, his part of the movie. But uh, yeah, I'm, I really like that movie. I think it's, and it's just, it's a real kiss huh, to the, to horror fans. Yes. It, it really, uh, uh, uh salutes, horror fans and the genre uh yeah. and and i think it's a bit of a, a a valentine to horror fans so i hope more people discover it. i guess the problem is the title because last the last showing <laughs> sounds like a runway show you know mm -hmm. in london a fashion show with alexander mcqueen models or something <laughs> I, I, I shall i watch this documentary called last <laughs> showing no it's not it's it's it that's the way the brits say Midnight movie, mm -hmm. the last movie that's screened during, uh, uh, you know, at, during the day. Yeah. The midnight movie is the last showing. Uh, but I, I wanted them to call it midnight movie here in North America, but they kept it last showing. And I, I think it confused audiences.
Another film of yours that I don't hear nearly enough about that I always spread the word about is Jack Brooks Monster Slayer. Oh, yes. I, I love that movie so much, and I was hoping it would get a spotlight in the in the dock, but there's there's your career is too varied for that. Well, Jack Brooks, you know, it first of all, it's a real homage to practical effects, you know, and uh, and it's wonderful for that. But uh, I, and I love Jack Brooks and 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 Trevor is such a. a a cinephile, you know, the, the, the star, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Trevor and, 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 and he was again, really fun to work with, but, uh, you know, the, the one that is really my favorite and I'm, I, my God, you know, we have, there's a great sequel script, but, uh, the great, the late, great Scott Wilson has passed on now and, and it had a quite a, an important role in the sequel, but, but, uh, the Leslie Vernon films, you know, the rise yes. of Leslie Vernon, uh, is, you know, behind the mask is, is I just think a terrific homage. If I, if Quentin Tarantino loaned me the Beverly movie theater in Hollywood for a double <laughs> bill of two of my movies, that would definitely be, you know, uh, behind the mask, the rise of Leslie Vernon and, and, uh, last showing because they are both such Valentines to fans, you know, as well as being mm-hmm. smart, well-made, tight little movies. Urban Legend, too. Uh, Urban Legend yes. is underrated. Uh, you know, a great cast, but that movie is so glossy, beautifully shot, very slick, wonderfully edited, uh, and, a, and a terrific, terrific film, and, and I think underrated. Now it's got, you know, now we've Jared Leto's got Oscars, you know, I would hope that yeah. maybe it, it gets shown in those, uh, in the Jared Leto marathons, you know. <laughs> well, we made sure to spotlight both Urban Legend and uh, Behind the Mask on the, on Joe Blow. I, I made sure to make some videos on them because I love both of those. Well, so they, yeah. we're, we're... Jamie Blanks is a really, really talented guy. Yeah. And, and, and our, and, and our DP. On that it, it, that movie was not low budget, but it wasn't big budget. But it looks, it I mean, it it looks like a million bucks and really holds up. And the cameos are so much fun too, with Brad Dorf and Loretta Devine and everyone. Well, and you've played a ton of wonderful characters throughout your career. And so, is there any character that you only got to portray once that you really hoped would get the Freddy treatment and get a ton of sequels? Well, you know, last showing. I mean, I don't know what the sequel would be, but he does survive. <laughs> yes. He is down there with his popcorn and no <laughs> one has caught him. There's, and, and you know, that actor that played the detective in last showing is such a great English uh, star. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and it's sort of set up that he would be sort of like a Columbo. And, and, and I would be his sort of, you know, his great white whale. And he would come after me much like, I pursue Leslie Vernon. Yes. In my sort of Donald Pleasance homage in uh in Behind the Mask. So that was a, a bit of a setup. Uh th- that I think and, and years ago I did a Phantom of the Opera and it 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 had this cross-pollination at the ending. And there was a sequel script to that called The Phantom of Manhattan. And if you know that Guillermo del Toro movie uh, with the mm-hmm. insect, uh, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it now. Kronos? Pardon? No, later. Kronos? Later. Oh. Uh, oh. The insect man. Um, it takes place below the city. Oh, Relic. Mark. Mimic. 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 Yes, Mimic. Sorry. So <laughs> this Phantom of the Opera also took place in the bowels of the New York City subways, it, 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 where all the old robber baron train cars are stored and that's where the phantom dwells now he's hidden there and he has a little mini gang a sort of uh uh, like fagan has in oliver twist he has Mm -hmm. this little gang of runaway boys they're like the mole people that live beneath (laughs) the city streets they never see sunlight and they go up and they perform minor uh robberies in the subways and from his car from his ornate turn of the century robber baron train car the phantom all disfigured is working on his opera his compulsion and he hears a voice of a girl singing in the subways for money and she's accompanied by a violinist her father an immigrant and she's an immigrant and she's blind and he 
<clears throat> patches up his face, and we know how he does that. And he makes his way up with his scarf to hear her, and he realizes her voice is the voice for his opera. And she becomes his muse, and he starts to give her some of the arias within his opera. And she sings them, and she's heard by somebody passing by who's in the New York City Opera. And they discover her, and they train her, and she's given an eye operation. Now, up until now, she's been blind. She doesn't see what I look like, her helpmate who's feeding her these wonderful songs to sing. And I defend her father who gets robbed. He gets ripped off by a gang of skinheads, and I defend him. He's killed, but I avenge him. She debuts at the opera. Her eyes have been fixed. And I see her from my private balcony seats. And then I leave. And the last image is me walking down Fifth Avenue. I take my cane and I pry open a manhole cover and I descend back into the bowels of New York. You know, I don't want her to see me. I can't allow that to happen. And she's a star now and she can she has her sight back and she sings, but she's looking for me at the end. And the snow's falling down and Robert England slowly lowers himself and pulls the manhole cover over. But this was the sequel to Phantom of the Opera. And I loved how it brought it into contemporary times, you know, because he lives forever. He, he kills and continues to live like a vampire. And uh, it was so arch and so romantic. And we never got to make it, but it was really good on the page. I hope it wasn't too melodramatic or silly. But it was really good on the, yeah, it was really, I mean, the all of the avenging of the skinheads was done like a great Charles Bronson movie, you know. Very violent. You got all your, you got all your bloodletting that you needed. Um, but <laughs> there was also just this great romance, you know. Mm -hmm. And as her vision slowly comes back and it's cloudy, you know, you would see her point of views of the Phantom, and he wasn't quite in focus, you know, and he could still hide. You didn't realize he was disfigured. You know, he would take her out for a romantic dinner. You know, she <laughs> just oh, I kind of love that stuff. Say, man. Well, thank you. This is I could talk to you all day. Thank you so, so much for this. And again, this has been wonderful for me. Thank you again. Check out my doc and check out my uh, my new I have a new film coming out later this year. Uh, Natty Knox. Natty, like the nickname Natalie, directed by my uh, my Phantom of the Opera director, Dwight Little. Oh, awesome. Uh, Danielle Harris doing her. I think it's her first mom role. But yeah, <laughs> it's a great little uh, homage. Awesome. Uh, uh, it's got a little dusting of Halloween, a little dusting of Nightmare on Elm Street, but it's really about a Roger Corman scream queen who comes home. She's one of those film actors who understands film. Robert Englund's a great actor. It's as plain as that. Mm -hmm.